Hello, good morning. It is Morning Coffee with Steve, episode 197 for Monday, September. No, not September. October 7th, 2024. I'm Steve Saylor. This is your daily show of gaming news, accessibility news, or updates about my life. I've got my iced coffee. I've filled to the brim today on my in my Matrix mug. Oh, yeah, that's the good stuff right there. Oh, definitely need that on a Monday morning. It's a little bit cloudy outside, so it's kind of one of those, yeah, it's, 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 it's a morning. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I hope you had a good weekend. Hope you had a, a, a relaxing time, or if you had to work, hopefully you had some chill moments to just kind of like just relax for a little bit for the weekend. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, I my weekend was kind of chill. It was mostly just working on uh, Dungeons and Disabled stuff, which uh, housekeeping, uh, today, I will be releasing the trailer for the brand new uh, mini series that I am doing on Dungeons and Disabled. If you don't know about my show, basically it's a D&D &D actual play show uh, called Dungeons and Disabled where I am the dungeon master and I, I have a cast of disabled players. Um, we also choose whether we decide to play as a disabled character or not. Uh, I have a, I, I recorded this mini series at TwitchCon and uh, I like uh, I have like seven players that I'm doing. It's called it's basically calling them mini shots. Uh, it's it, uh, they're like basically le less than an hour long uh, little adventures. Like they finish from beginning to end uh, with one player. It's basically one on one me myself as the DM and one as the player. And uh, so I'll be releasing the trailer later later today. So if you check out. DungeonsAndDisables.com, or uh, you can be able to check out the social media, uh, or the, our, our Twitter account specifically is probably where we're going to put it, uh, is DN Disables. Uh, you can be able to find it there. Uh, I would show it to you here now, but I don't have it ready as of yet. So um, as of recording this, so I'm putting this up to later today. Uh, I'll show it tomorrow. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right. Let's jump into the news because we got a lot of news to cover today uh one specifically happened like on friday and then one happened yesterday like huge news um but before we get into that i actually do want to be able to at least you know jump into some uh like just smaller bit of news before we get into the sort of the big stuff um this one i wanted to be able to bring up not necessarily because i'm a fan of uh, from software i you know of course like i would love to be able to play their games but when they add accessibility, when they don't add accessibility, it's kind of hard to. I'm not going to get an argument about from software and, and accessibility and all that stuff again, because I don't need 4chan harassing me again. That's a whole other thing. That that's another story for another time. Anywho, uh, but I do want to be able to call this out because this is good news in light of how the industry has been the past few years with layoffs and people like basically like losing money or studios losing money uh or spending too much money on, on stuff and and ceos kind of taking bonuses with like while their employees suffer all those like bad news it's good to be able to see a good news story so the first up is from software is increasing its average salary by around 12 percent is that from vgc uh by chris scullion uh, the Japanese developer stated that from April 2025, employees will get an average basic salary increase of around 11.8%. The starting monthly salary for new graduates will also be increased from 260,000 uh, yen, 100, uh, 17, $1,775, to 300,000 yen, $2,050, an increase of just over 15%. From software, we strive to make games that convey emotion, create value, and inspire joy. A statement from the company reads. To this end, we are working towards stable income and rewarding work, uh, an rewarding work environment where our employees can apply themselves to development. The increase in base and starting salaries is one implementation of this policy. We will continue to develop games with the hope of inspiring players and creating something of value. From Software's release, latest release is Shadow of the Earth Tree, a DLC expansion for its 2022 release, Elden Ring. I, I'm a big fan of this, uh, and it just it, it's 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 sad that this is not a common thing in Western uh, capitalist culture. 
uh, that it's it that this is a, something that seems honorable uh, within uh, uh, Japanese or at least Asian culture is that it's not the fr like Nintendo has done this before too. Like uh, they've increased salaries for for their employees or at least uh, had their you know, famously the CEO of Nintendo at one point basically cut his salary in half so that he could so that there was no layoffs. So in in, in the fact that I what I love about this is that regardless of my thoughts on Elden Ring. It obviously was a massive success for From Software, and I think that that is great, especially for a studio like that. Like From so like From Software deserves all the accolades and all the uh, and all the respect and all the sales numbers that it can get. So the fact that they're using that to keep player retention or not player retention, but keeping employee retention, keeping the be like the best people that they can that they know can make great games because it's been proven already. I think that this is huge. This is going to keep people from like uh, from wanting to leave. Uh, not necessarily that that's a bad like that's a bad thing, but um, it just it, it it keeps the like people wanting to make great games, and it, it provides job stability, security, all that stuff. Because uh, uh, like when you have people that have worked at a studio for a long time, you really kind of like there's a that's veteran knowledge that. In some cases, it's kind of sorely lacking in certain places in, in, in studios because a lot of people get frustrated with the, with the industry and leave. And there's very few uh, people that will stick around for at a company for 20 plus years. Um, that's that's few and far between. So this only helps kind of solidify the legacy that From Software is creating or has created uh, even further. So I love seeing this story. I love seeing that they're doing this and good on the uh uh like i i, I wish the best all for the employees there and hopefully that'll that that is that's sorely that i, I hopefully that's definitely that is needed and that'll continue to be happening uh for them that, that as they keep uh succeeding yeah love it all right next story uh we have silent hill 2 awards a trophy for trying to turn back and leave silent hill at the start of the game <laughs> Uh, it's also coming from VGC uh, by Chris Scullion. Um, so Silent Hill 2 is obvious is out as of tomorrow or uh, Wednesday. I can't remember which. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to be able to playing it. I have, oh, well, not looking forward to it. Looking forward to it is a very strong statement. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what accessibility is in there because I've seen little snippets of, of some of the settings that's in there. However, uh, I'm not I'm not a horror guy and and I've said this before on 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 the show uh it, it, horror games and me don't really mix well. Um and I've also talked about the fact that I did love the Bloober teams the medium. Uh I was a, I was a fan of that. Actually at the time when I recorded I actually went back to rewatch my uh my review of it and I actually said it might have been my game of the year. Uh it didn't but it was pretty dang close. Uh, I really did still enjoy it. And that was, you know, that was scary. Um, I know that Silent Hill is kind of a, known as being super scary too. So uh, I'm gonna definitely have to play this during the day, not at night, uh, but I'm still gonna try to be able to play this. Anywho, uh, it'll be my first Silent Hill game ever because I've never really played it before. Uh, anywho, uh, let's jump into this. At the start of the game, protagonist James starts from an observation deck overlooking Silent Hill. He's supposed to head down the stairs and make his way into Silent Hill where the adventure begins. However, as Automaton reports, players can instead turn right and try to leave Silent Hill by walking down a country road in the opposite direction. If they attempt this, the game will eventually give them an invisible wall. James is inevitably forced to face the horrors of Silent Hill, but it does at least award players with a PlayStation trophy the no turning back now trophy will be awarded with the description try to leave silent hill in the observation deck area silent hill 2 is released on october 8th so it technically is tomorrow on ps ps5 and pc developed by bloober team it's complete remake of the 2001 ps2 game of the same name anyway that's, that's basically it i just love that you want to be you want you want to be you want to be a scaredy cat like i am you know go and uh go and uh you just leave and then get a trophy. That might be the only trophy I get in the game. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine I play it on, on PS5 and uh, I only play it just so I can be able to turn back and just get that trophy. That's a badge of honor. That's better than a platinum, I think. <laughs> in my, in my bad. It's like you get the game, you play the game, or you get as far as, like, you, you, you start it and then you turn it back around and be like, nope, that's it, and get the trophy and then you never play it again. 
That's dedication to a joke that I absolutely like. <laughs> uh, all right. Let, let, that was the two kind of like funny stories, but let's jump into this big one. So this happened on Friday, uh, but I want to kind of at least go over it because I haven't uh, had a chance to sort of talk about it myself because uh, this popped up after uh, basically I already recorded ob- uh, the uh, episode for Friday uh, for Morning Coffee with Steve. So um, Tencent and the Guillaume family are reportedly considering taking Ubisoft private. This is uh, by v- uh, VGC uh, by Andy Robinson. Um, according to Bloomberg uh, sources, the... the Never mind. No, thanks. There we go. According to Bloomberg sources, the Chinese conglomerate, which already owns around 10% of Ubisoft. Actually, I didn't know that. Uh, Guillaume Brothers Limited have been speaking with advisors to explore ways to stabilize Ubisoft. One of the uh, possibilities discussed would involve teaming up to take Ubisoft private, it's claimed. Though talks are said to be on the early stage and there's no certainty that it will lead to action. Tencent and the Guillaume family are also considering other alternatives, according to Bloomberg. Last month's Ubisoft shares price dropped to its lowest point in nearly 11 years. The most recent dips followed Ubisoft's announcement that it delayed Assassin's Creed Shadows and the disappointing launch performance of Star Wars Outlaws. Early in September, a minority investor called in on Ubisoft's management to take the company private or let it be sold to a strategic investor. Hedge fund AU uh, or AJ, AJ Investments published an open letter calling for strategic and structural changes at Ubisoft. It urged the board to consider taking the company private, implement a comprehensive cost reduction program, and optimize staffing levels to be more comparable with industry leaders. In, uh, excuse me. Increase uh, its focus on core IPs and consider replacing current CEO Yves Gilmont. Excuse me. Uh, Slovakia-based AJ Investments holds less than one percent in Ubisoft. Um, yeah, this was kind of huge news. But although, it's like after reading this kind of now and just sort of seeing what had happened, um, I kind of, I, I kind of would. Uh, it's interesting. Again, this we've talked about already. Ubisoft, kind of like, what the heck is going on there? And uh, I, I mean, I've I've kind of not maybe not necessarily said out loud, but I, I or maybe I haven't. I, I just can't remember. But I do think that CEO Yves Gilmont is kind of is is need to, needing to step down. Um, it's not to say that he hasn't accomplished what he like a lot uh, what he was able to accomplish in the industry. However. A lot of the the issues that current Ubisoft has have has had over the past ten years has been because of him. Uh, like if, if it's whether a it's he's ignored uh, a lot of the allegations against uh, a lot of his executives. Uh, that was kind of a big thing a couple of years ago. Um, also trying to be able to fend off of a Vendi uh, buyout or its hostile takeover deal and and. Basically, and then also just just everything that kind of like Ubisoft has kind of done over the past couple of years that like there's a lot more mistakes than there are successes. Uh, and I think it all falls at the feet of Yves Gilmont. I think he and like and I didn't even realize that it's his family that kind of owns a larger like larger stake in the company. Um, uh, so and I, I just I just think that. Like honestly, I think it, it needs a new a new a regime change. I think uh, it just it's the only thing that will. I don't say the only thing. It's the one thing that I think will sort of maybe set the ship right a, a little bit. And because the because thi- the thing is, the story to me is not necessarily like that. Ten Cent wants to take like wants to um, take over uh, Ubisoft and make it go private. I don't like that either. I, I, I honestly don't. I, I think that Tencent owning bits and pieces of, of different parts of the industry um, can only lead to um, basically like a hostile takeovers in certain uh, situations and um, having uh, it, it, it like a conglomerating a lot of things. And this is kind of also the criticism I had with uh, Microsoft trying to be able to buy Bethesda and Activision is that it's it's putting it's creating this large conglomerate a conglomerate of studios that it's um, it can stifle a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, a, lo- a lot of great ideas for games. Um, and this is saying that something as someone who works like with Activision as a contractor for Call of Duty. So um, I'm not a big fan of conglomeration. I mean, I, I like I, I think that I, that being a, like it's a double edged sword where I think that it was it a, still the right move for Microsoft to buy Activision. I think so, because it helped push 
Bobby Kotick out, which was was desperately needed. Um, and there was a lot of issues with Activision that I don't th I think still kind of are here or still around. It's not to say that basically as soon as Phil Spencer took over that, you know, we cleaned house as far as Activision's uh, leadership is concerned. Or um, So it's probably, there are probably a lot of still like issues here at Act Activision that I, I I hope will get like get changed soon, um, but it didn't happen right away. But I guess the main thing that happened right away that I think a lot of people were, were hoping for was that Bobby Kodak, Kodak, Bobby Kodak would leave uh, and where they kicked him out. So... I think that was a good thing, and I think that it potentially could mean good things for the future for Xbox specifically. Um, but it still it still worries me a lot about the the fact that it is that it is being owned by one company, and uh, especially a large two two huge studio like publishers in Bethesda and Activision um, is that that's that's a lot. But to me, I think that the, the the big part of this story is is that Eves need, needs to, like I think needs to step down, and I I mean I because for the sake of Ubisoft, I, I'm not a business guy. I'm not a financial guy. I don't know what what needs to happen, and, and I'm not an executive at Ubisoft either. I don't have inside knowledge of Ubisoft. I know friends at Uber work at Ubisoft, but I don't like they're not like sharing trade secrets with me, obviously. Um, because that would be illegal. Uh, but I something needs to happen at Ubisoft in order for it to 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 to, to turn the ship. And I think probably the first step would be I, uh, uh, either Eve stepping down or potentially it going private. Because if it's going private, that means that it's not beholden to necessary stakeholders or shareholders anymore that it is its own company uh, and they can be able to do, they can kind of like be a little bit more nimble that way uh, instead of being beholden to shareholders. I think that's kind of what that means. I apologize if, that, if I completely missed the mark. I just think that it, there needs steps need to be taken for it. Uh, and uh, and I think that Steve stepping down would be a good step. Um, but with that, uh, there is a new story that kind of happened as of uh, this morning. Um, Ubisoft acknowledges buyout reports. We regularly review options. This is from Andy Robinson. Uh, last week, Bloomberg sources claimed that the Chinese conglomerate, which already owns 10% of Ubisoft and Guillaume Brothers Limited, have been speaking with advisors to explore ways to stabilize Ubisoft following a year in which its market value has more, more than halved. One of the possibilities discussed would involve teaming up to take Ubisoft private, it's claimed, though talks were said to be at an early stage. The report caused Ubisoft's share price to increase by nearly 40% compared to a week earlier. And in a statement given to VGC, the company said that it regularly reviews all its strategic options. Ubisoft has noted its recent press speculation regarding potential interests around the company, a spokesperson said. It regularly reviews all its strategic options in the interest of stakeholders and will inform the market of if and when appropriate. The company reiterates that management is currently focused on ex exiting, executing its strategy centered on two core verticals open world adventures and games of service native experiences ah man see that that that's what i'm talking about it's just it games of service is, isn't working anymore it's not working anymore it the industry has proven the 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 players have spoken no one wants games of service anymore and the fact oh, what is ubisoft doing what in the hell is Ubisoft doing? I love Ubisoft. I've always said, I've stated time and time again, their accessibility efforts are the best in the industry right now. They are constantly always improving their accessibility from game to game, from franchise to franchise since 2018, really. They've been doing it the longest. They've been doing it the best. And when with boneheaded, I like corporate bullshit. It's those, it's those, those accessibility efforts are gonna like, are gonna be lost to the wind if they keep going down this path, and Ubisoft starts to fail or starts to have to uh, 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 get rid of employees because uh, I, uh, I like they have over twenty one thousand employees that work at Ubisoft across all its studios. That's a lot of people. That's more than what like a lot of other like huge studios. 
And oh, just, oh, it infuriates me, the fact that they just don't get it. Executives at Ubisoft just don't get it. Players don't care about games of service anymore. It's not to say that they can't make a successful one. That's always a possibility. But mm, it's it, it's we've already we've already seen that basically there was one the one success that made it out of it, which was Destiny. And even then, even then, it still is now basically considered done. There is not one, there's not, I, I can't think, I really, like, legitimately, unless you know in the comments, like, I legitimately can't think of, of a game of service that's out today that people are enjoying or playing. Hell, Concord got reamed, and it wasn't even a game of service, but it basically was kind of almost set up as, all, as such, and that, I don't know if that was meant to fail or whatever, or they were trying to be able to get past that ideal, but people kept thinking it was, I don't know. I'm going off on a tangent that I'm just basically spewing stuff off that I, that I don't even really know. I just don't understand what Ubisoft is doing. I'm not necessarily a fan of Tencent owning them, but at this point, if that's the only thing that's going to right the ship to be able to, so that the players can, can enjoy Ubisoft games again, I don't know. I mean, I just, it, I hate corporate capitalism. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate what it does to, to the industry, especially this industry that I love where art is is monetized. I'm not necessarily being like one of those, okay, like you need to sell out in order to be able to make money in this industry, but it just seems that uh, the like executives basically make all the decisions and the people who want to be able to just make great games are kind of left in the dust. And just the two core pillars, games of service and open world. Open world, I gotcha, like, yeah. You're great at that. But games of service too? Uh, what a stupid statement to make. Anyway. All right. Let's jump into the the, the big, actually nice news uh, of, of that came out yesterday. Uh, Halos 343 rebrands and confirms multiple games coming using Unreal Engine. This is by Randy Robinson again at VGC. The news was shared during Sunday's Halo World Championship Tournament, in which it debuted a video showing a technical test of various Halo-themed locations running within Unreal. The studio stressed that the footage shown isn't a game, but a glimpse of, excuse me, but what it, uh, of what it might be able to achieve within UE5. A game engine is a framework used for the development of games. As the cost and effort associated with creating an original engines are high, most developers opt for an off-the-shelf solution such as Unreal Engine. Halo Infinite was developed using 343's own Slipspace engine, which was partly blamed for the game's last-minute year-long delay and sluggish rollout of post-release content. Discussing so uh, Sunday's announcement, Halo Studios head uh, Pierre Hintz suggested that the switch to Unreal will help to solve some of those issues. We believe that the consumption habits of gamers have changed, the expectations of how fast their content is available, he said. On Halo Infinite, we were developing a tech stack that was supposed to set us up for the future and games at the same time. Studio art director Chris Matthews added, respectfully, some components of Slipspace are almost 25 years old. Although 343 were developing it continuously, there are aspects of Unreal that Epic has been developing for some time, which are, uh, which are unavailable to us in Slipspace and would have taken huge amounts of time and resources to try and replicate. One of its primary things we were interested in is growing and expanding our world so players have more to interact with and more to experience. Nanite and Lumen, Unreal's uh, rendering and lighting technologies, offer us an op opportunity to do that in a way that the industry hasn't seen before. As artists, it's incredibly exciting to do that work. Halo Studios also hopes that switching to Unreal will enable it to more easily recruit new developers and get them up to speed faster. Alongside the engine change, the rebranded studio claims it's making changes to its culture and workflow, a workflow and how its teams are organized. That includes involving the community in decisions earlier in development, it said. Studio head Hint suggested that it will be some time before the public hears about its future Halo projects, saying that he wants the developer to spend less time hyping its projects without substance. One of the things I really wanted to get away from was the t continued teasing out of uh, possibilities and must-haves. We should do more and say less. For me, I really think it is important that we continue the posture, which we have right now when it comes to our franchise, the level of humility, the level of servitude towards Halo fans. We should talk about things when we have things to talk about at scale. 
Today, it's the first step. We're showing Foundry because it feels right to do so. We want to explain our plans to Halo fans and attract new passionate developers to our team. The next step will be taking, talking about the games themselves. Uh, I want to show a little bit of the video uh, to this because I, I think that that is uh, the showing off uh, it, it, the engine itself is pretty cool. So let me jump into Chris Matthews. Take one, Mark. This is uh, Take one, Mark. Here we go. Let me just. We really. There's so much. Let me just see what we what we got here. Uh, okay, so we got some. Looks how. In the north. But how many? Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is good. This really is a good section like to basically to, to show it. In the you know cascades. The cold lands, which was the second biome that we took on, it was more of a technical showcase where we could. Like, look how gorgeous shaders, that looks. We could play with deformable landscapes and terrains. Unreal affords us more opportunity than we've ever had in the past. You know, on the surface, it might just look all like snow, but how many layers of things combine? That's to so really damn cool. Winter look. And then our third biome was the Blightlands, which is any land that's been completely taken over by the flood. I wanted to give our team the opportunity to really express an alien world, a really alien world, taking something way further than they So this is not a game, by the way. This is just, just their own What's tech me uh, test, essentially. This is not going to be a game at all. Everything looks how incredible. It's just to see if they could do it. I don't think we've seen like pushing the limits like of Unreal. Unreal Engine before. Fortunately, we have a studio that's really passionate about Halo, about the look and the feel. And, you know, I think there's a lot of hunger to really collaborate, to move forward together. Foundry was an initiative that touched on every part of the creative process. Everything from concept art, VFX, characters, vehicles and weapons to make the future games of Halo. Creating an asset. Oh, look how design. gorgeous that now looks. We can really dig into material foundations. What is it actually made of? How is it physically accurate um, to the world? Now we get to take all the the wonderful oh, legacy assets. I mean that that, that energy have, sword just looks even life, cooler. Like it it, it uh, uh, a ma uh, man, it just looks dope. Like look how the detail on Master Chief's armor. We are really I mean, I know that they've had they like Halo, like Halo Infinite was a was, did look amazing. Like the armor so in that game or everything in that game looked gorgeous. When we get those but Unreal Five takes it to a whole new level. People bring in their expertise and uh, passion for the Halo franchise. We are looking for new talent as the projects that we're working on kind of get further and further into their development cycles. And it is great to be part of a team that's growing because you can kind of see that that force multiplied as people come in and take on challenges and you can do more. Imagine a place where you have the commitment. That's cool. That this is what we want to do, Halo games. And create those experiences. So long, 343 Studios. You express your talent. Hello, Halo Studios. Professional ambitions in that place. We're looking for designers, we're looking for artists, we're looking for engineers. It feels like a new beginning for the studio in a lot of ways, and I think that's pretty rare. And I think we arrived now at a point where you see the beginnings of people to start to believe in the process. There's so much momentum that we have right now and focus and clarity on not just what we're building. It's a fun story. Actually, I did go to 343 Studios at one point um, a couple of years ago. Worlds that were building. Didn't do any work on anything. Like I was, It was a, just a, a tour. And they have the Halo. I got well, I got, well, I got to talk about that in a bit. But they got a Halo uh, museum there that they have every single piece of Halo. Uh, right now we of Halo memorabilia, uh, memorabilia uh, and just Halo anything, including fan-made stuff. It's just dope. Like, look at, look at, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Just, just this shot of Master Chief. Like, look at that. Like, oh, that looks so gorgeous. Like, it just, and, and, and again, basically, so long, three, four, three. Hello, Halo Studios. Like that, that is just so dang cool. And I, I, I love, I, I love that. It's like it's, I, I, I'm a big fan of this. Okay. So you may be wondering, okay, why like uh, this, this is like, it, I did see some sort of sentiment being like, well, we it's not, well, okay, hold on. Why did the game, or oh, this will start. Okay, there we go. Um, why did, uh, like it, it, the game already looked pretty enough. Well, like I don't think adding Unreal Engine Five makes it like making it pretty is, is, is what's 
works. I think it's basically is what this uh, what Andy had said in this uh, in this article um, is that uh, essentially like Slow Space Engine was a, was a beast of an engine to work with, and as I said, it's there's a piece of that engine that are 25 years old. It is old. It is an old engine. It's antiquated. It's basically built off of just like patchwork and uh, like duct tape and paper clips like it's literally held together that much like that's why a lot of the delays happen with halo infinite uh because it just the engine just wasn't able to do the things that that other engines are able to do now almost seamlessly so by moving to unreal engine 5 um this is now the third major studio within xbox's own uh first party studios the fact that they've got the, the coalition and uh um and team ninja a uh, team ninja not team ninja ninja theory sorry um they've like and now halo studio is working on unreal engine 5 it just means that they are sort of they're they're, they're that expertise is, could be shared across their studios um which is which is great so by them moving to unreal engine 5 it not only helps them to be able to kind of get past the limitations that they had with slip uh with slipstream uh but then also allow them to the creativity to be able to create many different types of games as they as they said uh and this also has huge potential for accessibility as well um with more people working on unreal engine 5 and with uh, obviously the constant updates from epic it means that the more champions can be added in for accessibility to potentially develop stuff that either is plugins or in-house for unreal engine 5 to be added in for accessibility to make it easier for developers to include accessibility into their games because it's stuff that's already added in like imagine a screen reader api or screen reader engine that is just works within unreal engine 5 for every piece of text like you don't have to do anything it just it just you can just add it in and it'll just read every you can turn have that as an option and they will read every single piece of text that's in the game uh and and, and or be able to and, and you can be able to tweak it to basically just set okay here's the priorities of what things are read as long as you're able to label things properly it'll read everything like i would love to be able to see that happen it's still not there yet and it, it involves a lot of work from like from epic for a lot of work from other developers but i think it's it's something that is, is doable because it is an open it is technically almost an open uh, uh, engine. Yes, it is something that is owned by Epic, but uh, there's a lot of development that's always happening within the uh, within Unreal. And I think that with my Xbox having a culture of accessibility means that they can develop stuff in house that can be able to benefit other studios with hey, you, like for accessibility, being like hey, we, we we want your screen reader. Can we add that into our thing? Oh, we're, yeah, of course, because we're right using Unreal Engine Five. This is how we use it to implement it. It just means that kind of stuff is shared easily. I love that, and I think that that needs to happen more. Uh, I, I, it's not again. I hate basically saying like everything. I'm not saying that everything needs to be in Unreal Engine Five. It just means that when there's when. when there's this there's sort of like this engine that is large as, as this with a lot of it, like a lot of its development being developed by also the community as much as epic is it allows developers to have the creativity and the opportunity the technical um capability to create amazing looking games amazing games that can be run uh, can uh can really push the the industry forward but also as well like it has again there's a lot of potential here for accessibility that i'm i'm I, I love like and and the thing is with halo infinite it tried to be able to do a bunch of stuff with accessibility but it didn't really do super great i think that i think that this could be able to to help with that so gotta love it i i just i'm looking forward to more halo games that's basically it uh all right this is a bit of a longer episode today so i apologize but uh thank you so much for uh, for tuning in uh and i and and for watching uh i do appreciate it if you have any comments uh, down below, love to be able to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts on the new Halo Studios and the new, uh, them moving to Unreal? Uh, what are your thoughts on Ubisoft? Uh, and anything else I mentioned in today's show, please leave them in the comments down below, uh, both on Patreon and also on YouTube. If you want to be able to get the audio exclusive version of this on uh, uh, like and, and, and every day instead of uh, just on video or coming to my channel, you can be able to go to patreon.com slash Steve Saylor. If you could become a supporter, it would really help out a lot. Uh, then you can be able to get the audio version of this uh, sent to you. Uh, I, I, I was going to open up memberships to this channel as of yet for that kind of thing because i don't have anything like i can't just sort of give you like i can't 
audio uploads on YouTube is not the easiest thing to do or the best way to be able to go about when getting an audio exclusive version of the podcast. That's why Patreon is is available. But uh, um, I, I think one person actually asked about memberships and I was like, well, I'm not I'm not sure just yet. But um, for right now, if you want to be able to support me, best way is support, subscribe to this channel and also patreon.com slash Steve Saylor. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And uh, I hope you have a great day and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.